Uh, before we start service, I'd like to know if anybody has a testimony to give. And if not, I'll give a, a brief testimony. My grandma, I'm a player, as you know, is not with us today. She, uh, she was over my sister's house and she had a fall. And she had a hip replacement done quite a while ago, and her hip came out of place. So they brought her to the hospital. You know, we weren't sure if they were going to do surgery on her, but uh, thank God they were able to manipulate her leg and hip back into place. And she does not need surgery. So she's at home recuperating, and, you know, in your 80s, sometimes it takes a little longer to recuperate. So just keep her in your prayers. And I'm just thankful that uh, God, you know, touched her and she was able to not have to go under the knife. And... One more thing was that uh, I know I testified a while ago about uh, my job maybe coming to an end. They were uh, planning on outsourcing the facilities department. And uh, there's a couple of job opportunities that came up lately that I was able to uh, fill out an application. And uh, so Lord, you know, has made a way to provide for me and my family. So I, I don't know what's going to take place with that, so just keep that in your prayers also. So thank you. So just before I open in the scriptures this morning, I'd just like to pray. Our, our, our Sunday school is dismissed. So before service starts, I'd just like to open in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for the word. We thank you, Lord, that as the word goes forth, it will not return to you void. I humble myself before you, and Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak through me, that the words that I speak would fall to the floor, but the words that you speak would go forth and accomplish that which you would have to do. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I just have a, like a little poem I want to start off with, and uh, the author is unknown. And it says, he did not come to condemn the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek. It was to save that he came. And when we call him Jesus, Savior, we call him by his name. And as I was preparing this message, uh, I believe God laid on my heart that we should have a burden for lost souls. And I know that we do, but in to what degree? We, uh, you know, we're living in the last days and time is short, and there are so many people in, in the world that need salvation, so many people that are hurting, that need the Lord in their lives. And I know that many of us, before we came to the Lord, we were in various stages in our lives of hurt and disrepair, for lack of a better word. But as we, you know, someone introduced us to God, whether it was through a service or an individual witness one-on-one, -on -one, someone came out and reached to you. So I feel that it is necessary for us to do the same. So this is kind of what led me to prepare this message. So let me just start out with saying uh, we're going to be looking in uh, the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 10. And it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. It has been said that to apply that word lost to anything, it could spell tragedy. And here is someone, you know, if someone's blind, okay, they cannot see, and he has lost his sight. So he may go through life groping in the darkness because he's not able to see. He has lost his sight. And you could apply that to one's health. You could say that one has lost his health. 
He is no longer able to support himself or his family, and he lives in illness, and he is an invalid for his life. You could say that he has lost his health. You could apply the word to your mind. Someone could have lost their mind. But it's very tragic that the word loss could be applied to the human body. You can apply it to the eyes with the blind man, the strength of the health, and in the mind. But it is no tragedy compared to that when you apply it to your soul, a lost soul. We could say that if you're a Christian and you lose all your money, you could lose every possession that you have, and then you pass away and you go to heaven. Now what you had here on this earth, you lost it all. But in heaven, even though you went there with no earthly possessions because you lost it all, you will dwell in heaven and even the streets on which you walk in are made of gold. But what would you say about the lost man who accumulates the wealth of the world and he dies? What is riches compared to losing your soul? And we can look in the uh, book of Luke chapter 16, verses 22 to 23. And you're probably familiar with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. How that the rich man during his time on the earth, he had everything. And Lazarus was a poor beggar who during his time on earth had nothing. But yet when they both left this earth, the rich man uh, was in hell. And Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham. And he looked up to heaven and asked that perhaps even Lazarus would just dip his finger in water and quench his thirst. So, again, what I get back to with that is, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and loses his soul? And we see here, if there's a Christian who loses his health, he is broken of illness and pain, and then he dies. And there are no sick and no crippled and no aged and no infirmities in heaven. But here is a lost man who walks in strength all the days of his life, and he is cut down. And what strength or health and damnation and perdition. The grave is the end of all of the crippled, blind, or sick but it isn't the end of the soul. In other words, even though you die here on earth, your soul lives on into eternity. So it is a matter of, and we have a choice. God gives us a choice. We can choose to live for him and dwell with him in eternity, or we can choose the ways of the world, and ultimately when we die, we will spend our eternity in hell. As an unbeliever, uh, they are lost in this life. They have no God to pray to and no Savior to see them through. I can well understand why culture and civilization and national life and social life and family life are drowned in drunkenness and liquor and alcohol and in drugs. And they use that in any way to, to escape the dark uh, realities of this life. They have no God and they have no savior. The unbeliever is lost in death, and there is nothing that faces him but the impenetrable darkness of an everlasting midnight lost in death. And I think sometimes that as Christians, we don't realize, you know, we talk about hell and heaven, and I don't think we realize the reality of what hell really is. And I know it's not a place that we want to go, and, and we're not going there because we have our hope in Jesus. 
and we will spend our eternity with him. But think about the people that are in this world that need him, who are lost and going into eternal damnation. How it should stir our souls to go out and, and witness more, because as I said before, the time is short. And I just feel a burden in my heart to share this with you today that We should ask the Lord to put it on our hearts to witness to people that will be damned and lost in eternity. So the unbeliever, as he is lost in the great judgment day of the Almighty God, for we all shall stand someday in the presence of him. We all shall stand one day in the presence of who, him who created us, in him who placed the sensitivity in us, to face a call for salvation. For we shall all stand, all of us, one day at the judgment bar of Almighty God. And what shall the unbeliever say, shall he say in that awesome and terrible day? When you stand before God, and we all will on that judgment day, what shall we say? There'll be no excuse. If you can just imagine the man who rejected God's grace and said no to the appeal of our Lord. And you know, many times we have services where we have an altar call at the end and we invite someone to come and accept Christ. And it doesn't have to be in a church. Someone can accept Christ on the street. You can accept Christ in your home and do may kneel down at your bedside and just, you know, ask God to come into your life and make him Lord of your life because, you know, you just can't do it on your own anymore. But if you can stand, if you can just imagine uh, someone that had rejected God, uh, him standing before God in the final judgment day, and God turns to the recording angel and says, open the book of life, and see if you can find his name. And the angel turns and he thumbs through the book of life and announces to the Lord that I cannot find his name. It's not in the book of life and it has not been written in heaven. And then the lost man turns to the Lord and again, I don't know if this would actually take place, but this is just an example of, of what could take place and maybe it's just an example of me trying to get my point across. And the lost man turns to the Lord and says, but oh God, give me a moment to explain. And God says, the judge of all the earth will do right. You have eternity in which to explain. And the lost man says, oh God, it's like this. I was too busy. I was too busy for God, and I was too busy for Christ. You know, I had a boat out on the lake, and on Sundays, I was just way too busy. And I had my business on the weekdays, and I was too busy. I was just too busy. And what a shame it is that, you know, I mean, we're all busy. We all have busy lives. We all have family and jobs. And even as Christians, we can get too busy. But we need to just take time to read his word, to spend time in prayer. So we will be prepared for that day that when we stand before him, he can say, enter in, our good and faithful servant. So back to the lost man that's standing before the Lord saying he was too busy. And the Lord replies, but did I not write, it is appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment? And you can find that in Hebrews 9.27. And the Lord says, did you, did you not read my word that in my presence in the holiness of heaven 
your righteousness is as filthy rags. But, O oh God, hear me again. Listen to me, Lord. The reason I was not saved is because of all the hypocrites in the church. And the Lord said, Did I say to put your eyes on the hypocrites to be saved? Did I not write, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth? For I am God, and there is none else. And you can find that in Isaiah 45, verse 22. O God, said the lost man, listen to me. Please listen to me. O God, the reason I was not saved is because I never had the feeling. He goes on to say, I was waiting for some great emotional experience to lift me up and set me right into the kingdom of the Lord. And the Lord says, did I say anything about feelings? Did I not say believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? O oh God, says the lost man, hear me, hear me. There were so many cults and so many denominations. I didn't know where to turn. And the Lord God shall say, did I say anything about cults? Did I say anything about denominations? Didn't I say repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall be saved? You can find that in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 31. And he goes on to say, Oh God, listen to me one more time. Please, one more time. Dear God, says the lost man, I intended to be saved. I intended to confess my faith in Jesus. I meant to be saved. And the Lord says, did I not write in the book, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. And there's a good example for us. You know, we intend to do a lot of things. We have good intentions. But let's put our ten intentions aside and do that which we know that we're supposed to do. For well, good intentions will not get you there. But you must press on. And the recording angel opens the book and he writes beside that of the man's name the most tragic word in the human language. Lost. Lost in eternity forever and ever. And I know one time I shared this before when I was trying to explain eternity and it's, I don't know in our finite minds that we can really grasp it. So here's just an example of maybe it will give us a, just one small inkling of maybe what eternity would be. It says, if the earth were a solid granite ball and one time every 10,000 years a little bird passed by and just brushed it with his wing and when he had worn out this solid granite earth away, one second of eternity would not even have begun. So if we could just grasp that in our minds, because again, the unsaved will be spending eternity in hell, in a godless hell without Jesus, where we, on the other hand, will spend eternity with him in his glory. Will there be no sickness, no disease, no tears? We're just so thankful that the Lord has made, us, made a way for us to be saved. Oh God, I have my soul and that's all. Everything else that I have, including this physical frame, shall dissolve into the dust of the ground. And what shall it profit me if I shall gain the whole world and lose my own soul? God, be merciful to me and save me. What matters to me is my soul. I also have a, a poem that was written by J. Whitfield Green that I thought would be good to share with you this morning. When the choir has sung its last anthem, and the preacher has prayed his last prayer. 
When the people have heard their last sermon and the sound has died out of the air, when the Bibles lie closed on the altar and the pews are all emptied of men, and each one stands facing his record and the great book is opened, what then? When the actor has played his last drama and the mimic has made his last fun, when the film has flashed its last picture and the billboard displays its last run, when the crowd seeking pleasure have vanished and gone out of darkness again, and the trumpet of ages is sounded, and we stand before him, what then? When the bugle's call sinks into silence and the long marching column stands still, when the captain repeats his last orders and they've captured the last fort and hill, when the flag is hauled down from the masthead and the wounded in the field are checked in and the world has, that rejected its savior is asked for a reason, what then? Again, I get back to the scripture, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and he loses his own soul? That's why the gospel of Christ, he came into the world to seek and to save us who were lost. It is our duty to carry Christianity to the world because the world needs to be saved. Christ alone can save it. And we all know that scripture that says that we need to pray that the Lord would send laborers into, the, into his harvest. And again, I'm thankful for the evangelism team that they have heard God call that they would go out into the streets and witness to those that need to be witnessed. But not only that, it is each of our responsibilities to witness to those whether it be at work or family or whoever it may be, because Joe may reach somebody that I can't. Or Nelson may reach somebody that I do not know. We all know people that need to be saved, and we just need to reach out to them. And not only in word, but also in deed, we need to be an example. We need to live our lives holy and righteous before our God because many times people will look at you and they'll see by your example uh, you know the scripture says they'll know, you'll know a person by their fruit and, and how true it is because someone can say that you know they're this or that and then you see them in their actions and they're totally the opposite and so you know what they're saying is not true but again uh, I just want to, I, I can't express it enough that we need to reach out to those that need to know who Jesus is. And we just need to bring that to them. Whether they know it or not, they might not even know. They might not have even heard the gospel. They might know, not even know anything about salvation, but it's up to us to bring that to them and show them. It is uh, his power is the only power which will forgive and regenerate. His is the only power which will reach down deep enough to transform us and will hold until the transformation is fixed. And during Wednesday night Bible study, I know we've been reading in the book of Acts, and recently we read about how Paul approached King Agrippa and how Paul almost persuaded him to become a Christian. And in the summary of that, and again, you can go and read it for yourself. That's in uh, the book of Acts, chapters 26, verses 27 and 29. In summary, the king says that you want me to be a Christian, or whether you translate it, almost, you make me, to, he almost made him decide to be a follower of Christ. But the tragedy remains the same. The man was introduced to the gospel of Christ and a wide open door was set before him and he refused to enter in. He was so close but yet so far. 
And in the 14th chapter of the book of Romans, it says that each one of us must be judged for himself before God. We are accountable. Each one of us are accountable to God for ourselves. Someday when you and I stand in the presence of the judgment of the Almighty God, I shall be judged for myself. You cannot be born for me. You cannot breathe for me. You cannot live for me. You cannot die for me. You must die for yourself. And you cannot be judged for me. I must be judged for myself. And when I stand naked and alone before God, this decision I must make for myself, I am accountable to God for myself, just as you all are accountable to God for yourselves. Just because, you know, you're a young person, you know, your mother or your father's saved, that won't get you into heaven. You have to have your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You must surrender to him and live according to his word that one day you'll stand before him and be judged for what you did in your body. <clears throat> Why would one almost be persuaded but yet refuse to enter in? Sometimes the answer may be that they're timid. Or you don't have the courage to go forward. They're hesitant. They may be afraid. They may be reluctant. And many times, it's almost but not quite. And why is it that we make the appeal publicly to confess your faith in the Lord Jesus? It is because God asked it of us. It is not something that we just invented. It is not something that we thought up. It is something that God says. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, the Lord Jesus says, If thou shalt confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But if thou shalt deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. And in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, the apostle Paul wrote in verses 9 and 10, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in thy heart that he lived and that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart one believeth unto a God kind of righteousness. Let me restart this again. I want to make sure that you get what I'm saying correctly. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in thine heart that he lives, that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart one believeth unto God a kind of righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God says that, and we have no alternative. It is a mandate from heaven. When I accept the Lord as my Savior, I am publicly and openly to avow that faith, unashamed and unafraid. God will give you the courage to respond, he will strengthen you. You must take the first step, and God will give you encouragement and leadership for the rest of the way. And remember that when you come to the Lord, the angels in heaven rejoice. You can find that in Luke chapter 15, verse 10. Almost persuaded, but not now. Some other day, some other time, some other hour, but not this hour. Not this service, not yet, maybe someday, but not now. The Lord has such words to say to us, such words as are, that are in Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. He says this, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Never in all of the word of God, never does the Holy Spirit say tomorrow, Always it is now. And in the third chapter of the book of Hebrews, it says, Today, today, if thou wilt hear his voice, harden not your heart. Or as in Proverbs, verse 27, uh, chapter 27, verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. 
I have this moment, I have this time, I have this hour, I have this day. I have no promise of any other hour. I don't have a promise of any other moment. I don't have a promise of any other day. I don't even know what this day may bring forth. And that is so true in human life. We're not promised tomorrow. We don't even know what's going to happen when we leave this service. But God has set before us an open door. And this is the day of grace. Today, this is the day of salvation. So, in closing this message, and again, it was one of those things where you never know who's going to come to a service. And there have been many times when we have had a service and we have not had anybody that was a guest. Uh, you know, there's many people here this morning, and some of you I don't know. I don't know if you've given your life to Christ or not. So having said that, it's not up to me to make that decision. It's just up to me to put forth the word and allow the Holy Spirit to work in you as he sees fit. So in closing, I'm just going to make an altar call. And if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I would invite you to come and accept him as your Lord and Savior. And if you do know him, and you just want to commit more of your life to him, maybe he's put a burden on your heart to maybe spend more time in prayer with him, spend more time in his word. Maybe he's given you a burden for souls. I would just ask that you come this morning and just ask God what he would have you to do. So Jesse, as Jesse plays this song, I would just ask that you know you would come and if you need prayer, whatever it may be, if you want to rededicate yourself to the Lord for He's calling you, if He's speaking to you this morning for whatever reason it may be, I would ask you to come and just spend time at the altar. We're not in a hurry. Uh, again, if you have a need, come and we'll pray for you, whether it be a healing or whatever it may be. I would just invite you to come this morning, Jesse. If you play that song.